everyone, it's Sir Gantlot here again. Now I do have a couple of other videos uh, loaded that explain how to calculate the critical path through a schedule in some detail. But it occurred to me that it might be helpful to explain why uh, the critical path is critical in the first place. So to help you prepare for your PMP exam, let's dig into that just a little bit. Now in my personal experience, if you stop a hundred professional looking people on a street somewhere and just ask them the question, what do we mean by the critical path in a schedule? I know from experience the sort of things that you're likely to be told. Firstly, some people might simply say, well, the critical tasks are the important tasks and leave it at that. Now people who say that are right, but not for the reasons they think they are typically. Another very common answer is, well, those are the important tasks in the sense those are the ones my boss cares about, those are the ones that I have to report on. By far the most common answer will be this one. Critical tasks are the tasks that absolutely have to get done for the project to be complete. Well, that sounds plausible until you think, well, hang on a moment, every task has to be complete for a project to be complete. So. It sounds plausible, but it's, it's actually a nonsensical thing to say. So let's see what the correct answer is. The critical path through a schedule is both the longest and the shortest at the same time. So just read that a moment. Which appears to be contradicting itself, doesn't it, at first sight. So let's illustrate with a simple example here. Here's the simplest example I could think of, a project with two activities. On the left you have a start milestone, and as soon as the project starts, both task A and task B can start. And when they're both done, the project is over. Well, from the description, the longest path, and by the way, when we talk about paths, we're just talking about analyzing things from a logic point of view. There are two routes that you can take from that start milestone to that finish milestone. You could take a trip along task A, walk along that plank if you like, or you could take a trip along task B and then jump to the finish milestone. It's like two different stepping stones across a river almost. But the definition was the longest path or the longest of those two paths is task A. So that is the critical path. And it drives the duration of this project. So the critical path is the longest path and it's the minimum time in which the project can be completed as currently planned and I think anybody looking at that would immediately say this is a 20-day project. Now when we talk about the critical path and analyzing the schedule of course if someone comes in and works some extra overtime on task A it might get done quicker. However what we're talking about here is as currently planned as currently planned, that's a 20-day project. It's driven by the duration of the critical path. It's almost like task A is the long pole in the tent here. Well, let me ask you a question. How much flexibility is there on task B, that shorter task? Well, most people could just look at that and say, there are 12 days of flexibility. For example, I could afford to start that task 12 days after the beginning of the project and still get the entire project done on time. Or I could start task B, spend a couple of days on it, go away for a break for 12 days, come back and do the remaining uh, uh, days and still get the project done in time. But what about task A? How much flexibility do we have there? Well, zero. If we take a break in the middle of task A and don't do anything for a couple of days and then come back and finish it off, then the project is going to be longer. So here's the thing about critical tasks. Typically, they don't have any flexibility. And the term used for scheduling flexibility is float or slack. Either of those terms is acceptable on your PMP exam. Okay, let's dig into that just a little bit further. When you were looking at task B and saying there were 12 days of flexibility, what you might have been doing is comparing that point with this point here. Now, it's a strange term for that first point there on the left, early start. 
It doesn't mean something starting early, could start early, did start early. It means what is the earliest that can start based on the logic of this network. Well, the earliest task B can start as, as currently planned is when the project starts. The point on the right, again, doesn't mean anything is starting late or is going to be late. Late start means what is the latest that a task can start without extending the project duration. Well, obviously the latest that that task can start is right there. If it starts any later and maintains its current duration, it will push out the end date of the project. So we can actually use those two points to determine how much float or slack there is. In this example, let's say that the early start is day zero and the late start is day 12 because it's an eight day task. After all, and task A is 20 days. So the difference between those two, in other words, a late start of 12 minus the early start of zero is 12 days. So task B has 12 days of float or slack. Task A, of course, has zero because early start and late start are the same point. But another thing we could do is we could compare another couple of points, early finish and late finish. Now again, early finish doesn't mean that something is finishing early or will finish early. It means how early could something finish based on the current plan. And the earliest an eight day task can finish as currently planned is eight days after it starts. Again, we're not taking account of if someone comes in and works overtime. And the latest that task could finish without delaying the project is at the end of the project. So again, we could use early finish and late finish to determine how much float there is. It's going to give you the same number, of course. If we think that the early finish on task B is day 8, the late finish on task B is day 20, well again, 20 minus 8 is going to give you 12 days again. And in fact, what scheduling tools do, things like Microsoft Project Primavera, to determine which tasks are critical, this is what they do. Firstly, they identify for every task the early start, late start, early finish, and late finish. It performs subtractions, just like we did a moment ago, to determine how much float or slack there is on every task. And wherever the task has zero float or zero slack, that task is critical. It's on a critical path. And that method of determining the early start, late start, early finish, late finish is performed using something called the critical path method. It calculates the earlies, early start, early finish, on a forward pass through the schedule, and the late, late finish, late start, on a backward pass through the schedule. And on one of my other critical path videos, I explain exactly how you can do that manually but scheduling tools do this for you automatically. Now, some of you might have looked at, uh, in that third bullet there, when I say on a critical path and thought, hang on just a moment. Well, let's dig into that just slightly. How many critical paths are there in a schedule? Well, a lot of people will say there's only ever one critical path. Now, very often there is only one critical path, but there's no magic reason why there should be. In this example here, there's just a single critical path. As we've seen, task A is critical. The critical path here goes through task A. Let's look at this example. If task A and path B were both planned to be 20 days, then this schedule has two critical paths. So it is possible to have more than one critical path through a schedule, but bearing in mind that the greatest risk is on critical path activities. If any of them is delayed, the project gets delayed. If you have more than one critical path, you have an increased amount of risk. So as I mentioned, I do have other videos about the critical path where you can calculate it in more detail. Uh, I also have other videos on YouTube about other topics that will help you prepare for your PMP exam and a couple of topics to do with using Microsoft Project. Uh, recently, I rolled out uh, a, a rapid rollout methodology for project risk management. I put together a methodology that you can use on projects to deploy and operate risk management. Um, 
If you want uh, information about that, you can certainly look at the video I've loaded, or you can acquire the handbook from uh, Amazon or Lulu.com, that's the best price there. Having the handbook, just an 80-page handbook for the methodology, explains what it is, but it also serves as a license to use the methodology. And soon, and again I'll announce this on YouTube when we're ready to roll, we will uh, be delivering uh, live training sessions uh, that you can subscribe to, and also online training sessions. Well, thanks for watching. Please do take a look at any of the ads that popped up. Um, check out the people who are sponsoring this video. And if you're looking for actual support in the field of project management, risk management, uh, consulting or training, uh, do approach Westall Murray International. Uh, that's who uh, keeps me employed. And uh, I would welcome seeing you there. Okay, well, thanks for watching this video and I wish you all success in your PMP exam.